morning, friends, and welcome to another physical distancing service at First Friends. We are delighted that we can continue to stay connected and be together and worship. We do have a few announcements this morning before we begin. The Oak Leaf Meeting for Reading Book Club will meet Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. So if you're interested in joining this group, please connect with the office and they will send you the Zoom link. Um, we also wanted to let everyone know the Western Yearly Meeting annual session will be mostly virtual. Um, they've made that decision. There may be a service in Plainfield on Sunday, but plan to join electronically by Zoom for the other couple of days. Uh, we are going to have v VBS uh, in a virtual way this year, July 26th through the 30th. So if you have kids or neighbors or grandkids that would like to join us, um, we will be sending out videos and a box of goodies for VBS. So please let myself or the office know that you'd like your kiddos to participate. Um, we are also just very thankful that folks here have continued to financially support First Friends during these times. And we just wanted to remind everyone that there are a variety of ways to do that. There is online giving, giving by text. Certainly, we're coming in and getting mail at the meeting, so you can feel free to mail something in. Um, there's, there's just a variety of ways, and again, we so thank you for the support that you continue to show us. So let's begin our service today with an opening prayer, a prayer for just peace and nonviolence. God of love beyond measure, we hear your call to open our arms wide to let the suffering of the world come into our lives. We cannot remain passive in the midst of the challenge. We desire to live your love with total abandon, without counting the cost or the reward. We long to care deeply for all of your creation and to make a difference where we can. Help us to dedicate ourselves prayerfully and actively to banishing violence from our hearts, our words and deeds, to becoming nonviolent people, and to building nonviolent communities that care for our common home. Grant us strength and wisdom. We pray to enter into a life of justice and peace every moment, everywhere. Amen. This morning is from Micah 6, 8, the message version. But he's already made it plain how to live and what to do. What God is looking for in men and women. It's quite simple. Do what is fair and just to your neighbor. 
Be compassionate and loyal in your love. And don't take yourself too seriously. Take God seriously. Good morning, friends. This morning, I want to take us back to a past teaching that I shared with you over a year ago. I've reworked it to speak to our nation's current condition and how we as Quakers should respond. I pray it will speak to you this morning. As we've been working hard on creating our Peace Church Alliance, I have found myself having quite a few conversations about the Quakers' nonviolent response in these turbulent times. It seems in every conversation, whether about the racial unrest or the violence that has taken place or the ugly political scene, and even the toll the pandemic and isolation is having on our mental health, at some point, I'm returning to nonviolence and our Quaker peace testimony. Sadly, too often today, the nonviolent efforts that are happening go unnoticed by the news outlets because they are hard to sensationalize and get people to have a response. But as of late, I have started to notice side conversations beginning to happen, which are talking about nonviolence and peace and its importance in these difficult times. And that gives me hope that as Quakers, we have something to offer our world, and that it might be time to again speak up with our lives and voices. It's been over a decade since that pacifist progressive Mennonite friend I talked about last week in my sermon introduced me to the nonviolent way. And as I allowed him to mentor me, I found myself becoming more and more uncomfortable with the way I was educated, the things the church of my childhood had taught me, and how easily it was for me to accept violence and other beliefs that were counter to the teachings of Jesus, often in the name of religion or some denominational dogma. I was quickly realizing that violence was becoming more than an outward physical reaction and was often deeply rooted in many parts of my faith, which I had never carefully examined. I also realized something was happening within my own heart at multiple levels, and I knew that I needed to ask some serious queries of myself in relation to my own views and what I actually believed. This in many ways started a crisis of faith, or what some may call a dark night of the soul in my life. And as I said last week, it was in the, this crisis time around many issues that I headed into that year of diversity training at Huntington University and my first classes as a doctoral student at George Fox Evangelical Seminary. I love how God often prepares the soil of our lives before getting ready to plant new seeds into our lives. Most of you know I became a student of nonviolent heroes who I quote often, such as Martin Luther King Jr. and Mahatma Gandhi or Thomas Merton and Archbishop Desmond Tutu or Nelson Mandela or John Woolman and many more. Yet it was specifically in my study about Gandhi's influence on Martin Luther King Jr.'s spirituality where I began to hone my understanding of nonviolence and its importance at the core of my life. At the time, I had no clue that it was the work of Bayard Rustin, a Quaker and nonviolent activist who influenced King in learning about Gandhi. And over the coming years, I would begin to see the importance of the Quaker testimony of peace and how nonviolence could influence the world for change. As I began to study the concept of nonviolence, the following quote from Gandhi in a book edited by Thomas Merton titled On Nonviolence caught my attention. Mahatma Gandhi says this, he says, nonviolence is not a garment to be put on and off at will. Its seat is the heart, and it must be an inseparable part of your, our very being. If love or nonviolence be not the law of our being, the whole of my garment falls to pieces. Belief in nonviolence is based on the assumption that human nature in its essence is one and therefore unfailingly responds to the advances of love. If one does not practice nonviolence in one's personal relations with others and hopes to use it in bigger affairs, one is vastly mistaken. Now, to begin seeing the seed of nonviolence as my heart started an evolution in my soul. In many ways, I was learning, and for, the, for that matter, continue to learn each and every day that the condition of my heart was key to how I respond to my world. 
This was a little different than just saying I had the love of Jesus down in my heart like I was taught in Sunday school. This was saying that it was more than just an acknowledgement or belief. For the first time, I sensed the need to take care of nurturing my heart, finding inner peace, connecting to my inner light, and help to help me become a more peaceful and nonviolent presence in this world. I had to own up to and admit that some of the violence I experience in this world, I actually caused and still do. And it stemmed from my own soul, and it still does. It's clear from the conversations that are taking place currently in our communities and neighborhoods and on the world stage, until we deal with the violence in our own hearts, the violence is going to continue. This is where the issues of today are still our problem. Not just bad choices of people in the past. You and I sadly perpetuate the violence when we don't take a moment to look inside and admit our own violence and its impact on those around us. We can't deal with systemic racism or injustice or violence until we first wrestle with the personal violences within our own hearts. Gandhi wrestled with this as well. Not only did he begin to see nonviolence, or as he named it, satagara, as inseparable from our being, he also saw it as desperately important to the future and shalom or peace of humankind. Unless we found the seeds of nonviolence in our own lives, the world was not going to get any better. I've mentioned this before, but it should be reiterated here. On many occasions, Gandhi mentioned that the, he developed his ideas about satagara or nonviolence in large part from the New Testament teachings of Jesus. Gandhi considered Satagara as a way to synthesize Jesus' teachings about peace and nonviolence into the life of the individual. He believed that nonviolence came through embracing the qualities Jesus lived out in his life, such as loving our enemies, seeking truth, experiencing personal transformation, being people of virtue, and having a religious faith. All things that Jesus had lived out in his life and had said should flow from our hearts. If you remember, on one occasion, Jesus goes out of his way to make a point with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law about where our thoughts and beliefs and actions and what we say and believe are rooted. Jesus said it bluntly in Eugene Peterson's version of Matthew 12, 34 to 37. He said, you have minds like a snake pit. How do you suppose what you say is worth anything when you are so foul-minded? It's your heart, not the dictionary that gives meaning to your words. A good person produces good deeds and words season after season, and an evil person is a blight on the orchard. The importance of the condition of the heart was something that Martin Luther King Jr. also learned from Jesus. Bayard Rustin helped him nurture those beliefs by encouraging him to study Gandhi during the difficult days of the civil rights movement. King knew that retaliation or violent means were not what should flow from the heart. And if they did, it would only make things worse. Rustin showed King how Gandhi was leading sit-ins and walkouts and marches in India with nonviolent methods. And King adopted the same perspectives for this movement. The key for both of them was to make sure their heart was centered and in the right place. This is exactly what I've been hearing as I've participated with other faith leaders in peaceful demonstrations and prayer vigils and Juneteenth celebrations in the last few weeks. Over and over, the focus has been on how our current work flows from that same nonviolent tradition that Rustin and Gandhi and King modeled and lived. King realized nonviolence and nonviolent resistance were better responses to what he was facing. And like many today, there was a pushback, oh, and disagreement. King also realized that to do this work meant to go deeper and see what was behind the outward violence, 
something many people are calling our politicians and teachers and leaders on today. These are deep-rooted systemic problems that are going to take time in a nonviolent approach. For Martin Luther King Jr., going deeper and seeing behind the violence meant to start within himself. King said it this way. He said, nonviolence means avoiding not only external physical violence, but also internal violence of the spirit. You not only refuse to shoot a man, but you refuse to hate him. King's views changed dramatically as he internalized an ethos of nonviolence and allowed his responses to flow from that centered space. I believe King and Rustin and Gandhi all realize that nonviolence transcends our outward actions and must be rooted in our hearts where true love is found and nonviolence has its beginnings. Gandhi said it this way. He said, nonviolence, which is a quality of the heart, cannot come by an appeal to the brain. Nonviolence was not simply a body of knowledge to learn or be taught. It was something that, as I said a couple of weeks ago when talking about the beloved community, must be lived. If it is planted deep within each of us and is cultivated and nurtured, it will become a way of life. Martin Luther King Jr. broke down Nonviolence into six principles that clearly show us how nonviolence must stem from our depths, starting with them being a way of life. Let's take a moment to allow them to speak to our current condition right now. Principle one nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people. Principle two nonviolence seeks to win friendships and understanding. Principle three nonviolence seeks to defeat injustice, not people. Principle four, nonviolence holds that suffering can educate and transform. Principle five, nonviolence chooses love instead of hate. Principle six, nonviolence believes that the universe is on the side of justice. This is how King saw the beloved community growing into something beautiful by starting within oneself and making this a way of life. In our text that Beth read for us this morning, another prophet, the prophet Micah, said, said it this way, implying a nonviolent approach. But he's already made it plain how to live, what to do, what God is looking for in men and women. It's quite simple. Do what is fair and just to your neighbor. Be compassionate and loyal in your love. And don't take yourself too seriously. Take God seriously. Or as you may be more used to hearing it, he has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. What God wants of us resonates with Gandhi and Rustin and King, and I believe Quakers as well. It sounds simple, but it is the foundation for building an ethos of peace in our world. Our hearts should be filled with the desire to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with our God. And that, I believe, describes a nonviolent spirit. Folks, love is nonviolent. Love is peaceful. Love is kind. Love is what binds us to one another. And when that is what is found in our hearts, we can understand better King's words when he said this, love is a force by which God binds man to himself and man to man. Such love goes to the extreme. It remains loving and forgiving even in the midst of hostility. It matches the capacity of evil to inflict suffering with an even more enduring capacity to absorb evil all the while persisting in love. This, as Quakers, is who we are. I love how it is stated in our Quaker testimonies on the American Friends Service Committee site. 
It says this, in renouncing war and violence, friends embrace the transforming power of love and the power of nonviolence, striving for peace in daily interactions with family and neighbors and fellow community members and those from every corner of the world. This is who we are, folks, people who embrace the transforming power of love and the power of nonviolence. When we strive to live this out in our daily lives, not in extraordinary ways, but starting with our interactions with family, neighbors, fellow community members, we can begin to make a difference. American Friends Service Committee has offered some queries for us to ponder regarding nonviolence in our current times. As we enter waiting worship, take some time to ponder these as we wait and listen. One, how can I nurture the seeds of peace within myself, my community, and the world. Two, how can I be more open to seeking the goodness in people who act with violence and hatred? And three, how can I increase my understanding of nonviolence and use it in all my interactions?
Our benediction today is a prayer for peacemakers by Australian Catholic Social Justice Council. Spirit of God, give us the openness deep within us to recognize daily all people as made in your image and likeness. Help us to learn from one another the ways of being fully alive, at peace with ourselves and with those around us. Give us the courage to transform those parts of ourselves and the world that separate and create enmity. Help us to take steps to stop the cycle of violence in our homes, our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, in our country, in our world. May we be open to our deepest yearning for a world that is alive with truth and justice, to dream of a society where all are treated with respect and with the power of your spirit to take the steps to bring it about. Have a great week, friends.